Hi everybody, I'm talking about Dart today and one of the two reasons I'm talking about it because every time I mention to somebody that I'm a Dart developer, the person is either, what is Dart, or he is, well that's a kind of Java replacement, right? And I want to change that. So after this talk, you go out there and you meet me on the hallway, you hopefully have some idea what Dart is, what you can do with Dart, and then you can discuss the specifics about Dart and why I like it. The second reason I'm talking about Dart is because I personally think that Dart is on the rising side. So there is not much Dart going on right now. There is a small little group of people doing Dart, but it's not ready for, or it's not in the prime time yet. But given that Google is behind Dart, I think there will be much more coming. And especially since the AdWords team recently switched to Dart, so the AdWords platform now is based on Dart in the front end. And uh, one of the developers wrote a blog post, and he said that everybody who considered uh, is considering using Angular can also consider using Dart. And I think that's a pretty bold statement. But from my personal view, working with Dart, I think it's correct. And so think about it next time. My name is Sebastian, and I'm working for a company called Blossom. We are doing a product, product management tool, and we are using Dart in production since a few years, and we're actually one of the first companies deploying Dart code to production. And it treated us very well. We are very happy with the result, and we are very outspoken about the fact that we are using Dart, and we tr always try to uh, engage with people who are also using Dart or who consider using Dart, and that's why I'm here as well. So why would you choose Dart? I mean, that's some pretty good stuff there, but there should be like real reasons why, why Dart is, is something you might consider. Well, um, it's a consistent language, so that means it was built in the, the last few years with the current tech stack in mind. So when you look at JavaScript and other languages which are rather old, like PHP or even Java, you have um, many features which were put on top of the language which are not really thought of when they developed the language because they were not even there yet. There was no real reason to think about this stuff. And now we are in a much, much different place than we were like 20 years ago. So um, Dart being started in this time and age is um, much more consistent with the features. Um, it has a great standard library, so there is much stuff you need on a day-to-day -day basis already in the standard library. You don't need any extra libraries for this. It comes with battery is included, and it's a general purpose language. A few examples of the consistent language that Libros I actually like is everything is an object, much like, for example, Java, but actually a little bit more than Java because also strings are objects, and everything is an object, and really everything. Then we have optional static typing, so you can decide to type everything, or you can just type, uh, for example, your public API stuff. So if you write a library, you can actually type uh, the stuff which is public facing and internally use var, var for um, um, uh, dynamic typing. Or you can just omit types altogether and write how you would normally write, for example, JavaScript or in PHP with no types at all. Then there is the async await part. So it's asynchronous, already built in. There is no working around it. It's like a uh, first-class citizen. And we also have the library system, so you can actually import other libraries. You can export your own library for others to use. And it's already built in, so there is no workaround, no, no adding on top. It's actually in there. Yeah, sorry. Um, it has a great standard library, so it comes with, for example, async support. I already mentioned it. It uh, comes with math and convert stuff for JSON already in there. And also has Dart HTML and Dart JS for the client side. So when you are developing client side code, which you can then transpile to JavaScript, you're using Dart HTML to interact with the DOM or Dart JS to interact with other JavaScript libraries, and it's already built in. If you are on the server side, so Dart is also on the server side, so um, you can write what you would do normally with Node.js in one language, 
and you got Dart IO for all your file system access and stuff like this. It has batteries included, and if you're reading this and you're familiar with Go, then you might see the, the similarities there because Dart and Go share kind of the same philosophy when it comes to this batteries included part. They uh, both come with a lot of features already in there. So you have Dart, the normal interpreter part, then you have Puck, the package manager, and um, you have the formatter, the analyzer, and the transpiler, and you all of this in one module. So there is no, for example, fighting over which package manager you use because it's already in there and pretty much everybody uses it. And one really nice example of why this matters is the formatter because I've never seen in one year of doing Dart, never seen any discussion about which, which uh, coding style to use. Because you run everything through the, through the formatter and what comes out is the standard pretty much. There is no discussion, much like in Python or PHP, do we use this, do we use that, then you're switching companies or working on a different project and they have different, different formats and you need to change everything. In Dart, this pretty much ne never happens because everybody has agreed on using the formatter and there you go. And it's a general purpose language, so you can use it to work as a JavaScript replacement or a JavaScript enhancement in, together with your other JavaScript libraries. And you could, for example, use Angular Dart or Polymer Dart, which are pretty much ports of these frameworks to Dart. You can also use other frameworks which um, are developed specifically for Dart. But you can also use it on the server side and use one language to write your client side code or your server side code. There are frameworks like RPC or Redstone, which is pretty much uh, something like Ruby on Rails for Dart and others as well. And on top of that, there is Fluffer, which is the mobile part of the Dart language. And this project aims to, to create a framework with which you can write code for Android and iOS in the Dart programming language and then export it and have the the APK, APK or the IS version ready to deliver. And their vision, and this is a pretty interesting vision, at least from my point, is that you're writing your business logic and all the stuff which you need on your, on your web page and on the, or on your yeah, web page and in your Android application and your iOS application, which is like maybe 80%. And then for every platform, you add 20% of the let's say the layout and uh, the view part, which might be different because on Android you have, might have different toggle buttons or anything, and on the web you might have a little different stuff, but actually it's the same, the same application. And instead of writing it on Android and then on, on iOS, you write it in one, um, in one, only one time. And all this with native support, so you're not like, like you would with um, many of the many of the mobile frameworks out there, you're actually writing HTML and it's just presented as an Android application, uh, like PhoneGap or anything. It's actually native, native code coming out of there. So why would you not use it? I mean, it's, it's great, right? But there are a few problems, like with everything. Everything has its downside. And one of them, and I think a big one, is it's a new language to learn. So it's not like when you're, for example, using TypeScript. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, so you kind of know your, the ins and outs, and you have to adjust to a new syntax. That's not with Dart, because Dart is a new language. So you need to start from step one. And if you are familiar with object-oriented programming languages, then you might see the, the similarities, and you might be able to pick it up. But it's still a new language, and with every one of us having develop, uh, features to develop and bugs to fix and all this stuff, it's really hard to get time to learn a new language. And it's hard to find experts because, as I already said, it's a small community. And if you are in Zagreb, a company developing, and you decide, hey, let's do Dart, and you're reaching out to the developer community, hey, we need Dart experts, then you might have a hard time finding them. Because as far as I know, there is pretty much nobody doing it in Zagreb. Maybe not after my talk, but not right now. So you have two options. You can either go global and do remote work or anything like this, or you're teaching people and uh, have them learn on the job. 
but this might not fit your idea of development time and stuff like this, so it's, it's hard. And especially if you're starting out, if you already have a stack, so when I joined Blossom, there was already a Dart stack, and I could pick up the examples and like, fix a few bugs here and there, and then I get used to it and I learn. And if you have, like, starting all over, then um, you need to actually make those experts. You cannot just hire them. And it's a moving target. And by moving target, I'm not talking about the Dart programming language. It's pretty stable, and there are a few things that get deprecated. But it's pretty stable from my view, and we don't have much problems with it. But the uh, ecosystem is in uh, a huge, um, what do you say? It's actually, it's pretty fast in the development cycles. And you have, for example, stuff like people are creating some library, and they're really engaged. And you're deciding, hey, that's a great library. I will use it. And three months later, they are like, oh, no, I don't think I don't need it anymore. Or I don't, I'm not even doing Dart anymore. I got hired by somebody else. And nobody's developing it further. And then the bugs come, or the deprecated stuff comes, and you're pretty much screwed. You need to develop it yourself or migrate to something else, and then you're Kind of, yeah, you have a lot of work to do. And if you think about it, this happens in JavaScript, I believe, because you have many, many small libraries, and then one gets deprecated, and you need another one. But for example, in Python, this didn't, doesn't really happen with the, like Django, for example, because it's really, it's there for a long time. And sure, it gets its features, but you don't even need to pick them up. It's really stable from, from right now. So that's a, that's a safe bet, as you would say. Now talking about all this, why it's great, why it's maybe not so good, let's look at the, f the language itself. And I have picked a few examples which are pretty easy ones just to give you a feel about what it's like, how the Dart code actually looks like, and give you an idea of a few features. This is not exhausting in any way, and there are many other features which I'm not able to mention in a short amount of time. But let's have a look. As I already said, there is um, optional typing. So you can have either a string or a variable. Doesn't matter. Under the hood, Dart figures out, OK, first name should actually be a string. So it converts it to a string, and it stores it as a string. And you compare those, those and it asserts that they are the same. You can also do this in function and method calls. So you can have either, either require a real string, or you say, give me whatever you want, and I will figure out what to do with it later on. Then you had function arguments. And there is the first one, arg1, which is pretty much the standard required argument you pass in. And the second one with the braces is the optional one. So you can pass it or you cannot pass it, whatever you like. If you don't pass it, in this example, it's null. But you can also have a default mentioned in there with the equal sign. So arg2 equals hello, and then it would be hello. And you can also have named arguments. They are with the curly braces. So when you need, want to parse arc2, you, would, you actually have to mention it. This is arc2, and that's what the value is. And then you're passing it in. And you can't combine those two. So you either have the, the curly braces or the normal braces, so optional or um, named, but not both. With constructors, they did a pretty neat thing. Instead of you having to type, um, this first name equals first name, and this age equals age. If you just want to assign the variables passed into the properties, you can actually just shortcut it with this first name, and it automatically gets assigned to first name, and this age to age. You can also add um, the curly braces and do a body, function body, or method body in this case, and have some other stuff going in there, calling some methods or anything, but you don't need it, and this is a pretty nice shorthand, except ex especially for models or anything where you usually just want to pass in the properties. Yeah, you can, of course, just do it like you normally would in other languages and just work with it and uh, convert it or anything and do it the old school way. The way you would use such an... Um, object or uh, a class is you instantiate a new object. And this pretty much looks familiar, I guess, because it's like this in many other languages. And what you might not recognize, or except especially from this example you're not able to recognize, is that um, in the example Sebastian.firstName is not an access to a property, but actually calling an implicit getter under the hood. 
the same way that this is calling an implicit setter under the hood. So what this means is that you think you're accessing a public property, but you're actually going through a getter and setter. It's just not there yet. You didn't implement it, it's just implicit. And you're like, okay, well, that's, that's crazy, right? This is like, why would you do such a thing? And I was like, this doesn't even make sense when I started. And then somebody told me, what this means is you can actually change your, in this case, the user object, and make the properties private, and in Dart, that's with the underscore, implement a getter and a setter, and you don't need to change your code, which is actually using the object, because it's, again, getting through the setter and the getter, and now you make your um, properties private, and you can decide if you want to expose them or not, or what you actually want to do with it, and the client-side code, or the, the code using the model, the user object, is not there is no need to change it. So with this example, the code would look exactly the same, only that we don't have a getter for age, so you're actually getting an error if you want to access it. And this is pretty neat, because what it means is that you are starting out with all your properties public, because there is no need to do a getter and a setter in the beginning, and if you decide, oh, no, I don't want to expose this one, then you're making it private, making a setter but not a getter, or the other way around, whatever you want, and you're the code using the, the object is not even, does not need to change. And if you think about, for example, Java has this problem that they always have private methods um, everywhere, and you are pretty much, you need to do it because otherwise, when you decide one, one property should be private, you need to change everything. And that's not the case with Dart. There are exceptions, of course, and the neat thing about it, exception is you can throw pretty much everything. You can throw objects, whatever you like. String in this example, you can... Of course, there are exception objects, so if you want to throw a real exception object, you can do it, but you can a string... You can, if you, for example, have a user object and it has some error, then you can just throw the user object. And then you can obviously sort it out later. So you can say, okay, uh, if a string is the exception type, <coughs> Sorry. Then you're catching it and you're printing the string, and this is a generic exception, so catch pretty much everything. So it can be really fine grained there. And this is pretty nice in the front end. If you are one layer below the actual user interface, you can just throw the, the error message, and you don't need to work with objects and then convert it back and extract the string and stuff like this. And there's string interpolation interpolation, so you can actually do stuff like this, um, and it evaluates it inside the string. And you can also do it with function, which gets dirty pretty easy, so don't overuse it, but at some, some places it's really, really neat. I already mentioned async and await, and if you're familiar with uh, this concept, then you might recognize this. If not, it's pretty much waiting for the long task, which is an asynchronous task, so you don't know when it completes, but you're waiting for it, and the code below is only executed when the task actually completes. If you would omit the await, then it would just go on, and you would actually not be sure that this task is, is completed. You can do the same with then, so you can say, okay, when the long task completes, then do something, and just go on otherwise. So, we talked about the, the language features, we talked about a little bit about the syntax and what it has to offer, but what about TypeScript? Is Dart really needed in the age, time and age of ty TypeScript? And I think it is, first of all, and I already mentioned this, because, or I didn't mention it, whatever, um, uh, I really like having languages to choose from. So on the, on the server side, we're already there, we have PHP and Python and somebody likes to do Clojure or Haskell or whatever. And you can just choose the best which fits your use case. And um, on the client side, we are not really there yet. There is JavaScript, obviously. And then you have some supersets like TypeScript or CoffeeScript, which introduce some new syntax and have some additional features, but they are still pretty much JavaScript. And for me, having Dart and having the, the, the features it has to offer is really adding a new a new language to the ecosystem, and now you can be really making your choice for your project and say, okay, for this project, TypeScript is the right choice, and for this project, Dart is the right choice, because I also need 
Uh, I also want to do a mobile application, and Fluffer is really compelling, so I, I will do everything in Dart and don't need to write the code two or three times. And what about vanilla JavaScript? Do we, all, do we need everything, anything of this? And again, if you, have, if you have worked on vanilla JavaScript or some JavaScript family, it gets messy pretty fast, especially with big applications. Because as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, JavaScript was not designed with this type of system in mind. So when you think back 20 years ago, there was a little bit JavaScript to have snowflakes or something on your screen. And everyone was like, oh, it's winter, nice. But it wasn't like single page applications or anything was in the mind of people. So there is really a gap between uh, JavaScript 20 years and uh, what you do now. And yeah, as I said, it's, it gets messy pretty, pretty easily. And from looking at our Dart code, which is, which is a single page application, which is pretty big, it's very, very structured. And you're having a hard time making a real mess. So of course, you can do little messes here and there and not be, not be uh, very precise about what you're doing, all this uh, code, code quality stuff. But it's really hard to, to completely blow everything up. And that's what I like. So to sum it up, we are having a really good time developing Dart. And I would really love if some of you say, hey, wait a minute, that's, that's some pretty, pretty nice things over there. I'm going to try it. And I'm going to take a weekend project or a small thing, or my company needs some internal stuff. And maybe we try Dart for once. And if we are happy with it, maybe we roll out it a little bit more. And then when I come next year, everybody will not be like, hey, um, I don't know what, what Dart is, or I, I heard of it, but it's this JavaScript replacement, but actually be like, hey, I did this one little project, and I really liked it. And I'm like, yes. 